Good morning, Moto America fans. Well, maybe it's not morning, maybe it's afternoon, maybe it's evening, but it's morning for us. And it's a good one so far. This is Paul Carruthers, and this is Off Track with Carruthers and Vice, Moto America's weekly podcast. We've been on the road here lately, uh, actually haven't done it from our home bases. We've been able to, uh, at the last two races, uh, do some podcasts actually at the events, which, uh, which work out nice. But uh, Sean, how are you today? Yeah, I'm good. I mean, I uh, went into that weekend not feeling real well and kind of got through it. I still got a little bit of a head cold now. I don't really know if it's the time of the, the year or whatever, but um, it's crazy. I got back home and it feels like it's fall time now. And I, I think when we talk to our guest, he may say the same thing because he's on the same sort of latitude that I am, even though he's further east. But um, yeah, I don't know what happened. It's like, geez, if we had a race weekend up in this area it'd be like you know you'd be wondering about tire grip i think so um it's changed it's funny because people here you know we don't we don't experience much of a, a season change but it's it just yeah. it just has a little bit different feel to the air to me like and, and it's funny because when i left to go to uh to our last round at barber it didn't have that feeling and then i came back five days later and suddenly it feels like it's fall yeah yeah, and I always talk to, I actually always talk to Brian Jay about this. The lighting's different. And it has to do with, obviously, you know, the fact that days are shorter. And it's just the lighting feels so weird at the end of the day. And not weird. It actually feels, it's kind of cool. I like the way it looks. But um, it uh, it definitely makes it for a change in season. But makes it work a little bit better with football season. But um, it was interesting for us this year because, you know, we went from nine rounds last year to 11 i mean we had 10 but we had daytona too which was an extra round you know not an extra round for some of the our series but certainly it was for you know junior cup um even though well junior cup actually didn't they did they have 11 rounds no oh no they didn't race at coda they didn't race at coda so they had they got their 10 rounds in that's that's what it was it's always interesting how when we go to coda for Moto GP, we only have the superbike round and everything. So um, that's pretty interesting. But we got we got a lot of racing in this year, that's for sure. And I mean, it was crazy that everything came down to the end like that. And I know we'll talk about it when we get our guest on, but it was amazing how a couple of the classes ended up with in the points and everything too. So um it was pretty pretty exciting all the way around. Yeah, I thought it was a really good year. It's and, and like you said, when, you know, we come down to the last day of the year and there's, you know, three championships still up for grabs, it's kind of cool. And yeah, we had two classes end in a complete tie. And then the tiebreaker is to go to, you know, the, the, the racer who has the most wins, which, uh, you know, it seems like the fairest way to do it, but man, I'd hate to be in a tie. I'd hate to be in a tie and, and, and lose in a tiebreaker because I mean that you can't get any closer than that to winning a championship. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's funny, um, you know, Gus, who we're going to have on here, Rodeo, his dad reminded me that, and I know Gus is well aware of this too, is that they actually had, you know, Gus was involved in a, in a deadlock points tie for the championship. And his teammate, Anthony Maziato, was involved in a deadlock tie for second place in Revit Twins Cup. So it was weird that Rodeo Racing's team had two riders that were tied on points, one for the win and one for second place. So um, it was just kind of interesting that it came down to it like that, but good season. Well, why don't we get into it? Like you mentioned, our guest today is Gus Rodeo, and he was one of the guys that uh, that ended the season in a tie uh, and lost with a in a tiebreaker to Cody Wyman. They both had 285 points, came down to the very last race of the year, and, and in that class, the very last lap of the year. Uh, Gus ended up with uh, three wins and 11 total podiums. Uh, the, his last, I mean, this kid in the last six races, I don't think there was anybody more impressive than him. You know, he, he, he had two wins and four podiums, like I said, in those last six races. And, you know, seemingly was out of any sort of realistic chances of a championship. And just like that, he was he was right in the midst of it all. So you know, I, my first question to him, you know, he had the one DNF, which I'm sure is going to be a natural, but my one question that I'd like to start with Gus is which of all those races, when you look back on, can you just think of like 
one or two points just getting away from you? And obviously the DNF is a big one, but is there any race that you're just like, oh man, if I would have just done this? Um, huh. I think, I think Brainerd, Brainerd was bad for us. Um, really, when I look back on all the weekends, and I think about, you know, a, a weekend that just went wrong. It really was, um, it was really uh, Brainerd. I think race one, we uh, obviously got into turn 12 a little bit deep there under a few people and just made a simple mistake. Um, you know, we did pick up the bike though, and we finished in eighth and that would have been eight championship points. So if you look back and I hadn't gotten those points taken away, I think the championship would look a bit different right now. I'm trying you know, to think. Gus, you um, What's that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, keep going. I'm sorry. I was going to jump in, okay. but you, you keep going. Yeah. Um, and then Laguna, we had another crash and that was out of the lead. Um, I believe, I think I picked up the bike and finished 11th. So we got a couple points there, but I mean, we threw away a race win there as well. Yeah. I mean, Gus, when you race in junior cup, uh, it's, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. And I know for any racer in any class, you kind of don't know what's going to happen, but you take somebody like Jake Gagne. I mean, I think he's got a pretty, quite a bit of confidence that he's going to be towards the front, just the way things are. And, you know, could be battling, but uh, after a couple of years of what he's been doing, whereas your situation, and I'm not saying it's with your results. I'm saying it's the way racing is in junior cup. You guys are in all those crazy packs and you can go from, I don't know, fifth or sixth, maybe even further back to the lead a bunch of times, even on, on a particular lap. So when you go, when you approach a race with confidence, do you kind of feel a little bit like it's, it's a little bit the luck of the draw sometimes? Yeah, honestly, sometimes I do feel that way going into a lot of races this year, I would kind of think, well, okay, I know that nobody's going to pull away from me. So it's basically, we, we got that covered, but the next thing is, are you going to win? Or are you going to finish fifth? And a win is 25 points. Fifth is I believe 13 points. So 12 points on the line in just based on where you are on the track by about half a second is, I mean, that's pretty crazy. And, um, I think on, on longer tracks like road America and, uh, Brainerd, a few other ones, I think it is kind of the luck of the draw, but you can, you can kind of sort it out a little bit based on where you put yourself throughout the race. And I think we kind of, we kind of figured it out a little bit towards midway in the season that, listen, if, if you're going to drop back any lower than third, I, uh, I don't think you're going to win the race because you really need to be up at the front and, um, you know, when the last lap comes around, you only have two guys to pass based. If you're in, you know, six, you have to pass five people to get a race win. It's just a lot more work. We talked in a general sense about uh, drafting. And I think we see it on the track with you guys. But I always wonder if it's truly a drafting situation, if it's some kind of a momentum, what is it that makes you guys able to, kind of slingshot i mean i want to talk about the ride that you had at new jersey where i called i started calling you moses after that because you were <laughs> you were a little ways back and all of a sudden the guys moved over it's like the sea parted and you just shot right up through there did you do that because of a draft yeah um well there was a few different things that played into that um when I saw the guys in the top three start to rub elbows, I instantly knew just based on, you know, I've been one of those guys that's rubbing elbows and I've gotten past in the same way. It's just, it's friction. It's, it slows you down. And that's exactly, you know, not what you want. I think if there was any place to be, obviously in that race, it was in fourth and I kind of, I drafted one person and I just so happened to get lucky enough that that person was in another person's draft. So as they pulled out of their draft, I pulled out of theirs. And it was basically, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, really, when you're talking drafting. It was just absolutely perfect. 
Well, we know you, you told us at the, in the press conference on Sunday afternoon that you were, that was going to be your last junior cup race and you're, and you're going to move up to twins cup. Now, although twins cup is probably, it, it's a bit similar to junior cup in that there's a bunch of guys racing for the lead. It does seem more like if you have the pure speed and you're on it that weekend, that there's more of an opportunity. And I think that that changes as bikes get bigger and more horsepower, et cetera, that you actually have a chance of like pulling away and the fastest guy winning all the races that, the, that he's the fastest in. Does that, does that make sense to you? Is that something you're kind of looking forward to? Yeah. Um, come, come Daytona in the twins cup. I know, I mean, I raced that last year and, um, come Daytona, it's going to be a junior cup race. There's no, there's no, um, faster guy pulling away come Daytona. But when we get to a track, like, you know, the normal circuits, like Atlanta, um, VIR, everything like that, uh, in the beginning of the year, I, I feel like it is definitely closer. The twins cups closer to like a stock 600 race. And I think you can obviously pull away. Um, the draft isn't as important as the junior cup. And I'm really looking forward to not having to deal with, um, feeling like I'm being like, you know, pulled back and, and held up just because the draft really does like the draft is good. If you're struggling that weekend and you just need that last, you know, half a second to make up in the race, but it really, it really sucks when you're that little half second faster than everybody. And next thing you know, you're in a pack because you just can't get away. Right. And I think that's going to change for you. Like you said, Daytona is an anomaly in that, you know, every, every class that races at Daytona doesn't, doesn't have that. But uh, when you go to those other tracks, you'll notice, like you said before, you know, you qualify really well in junior cup and you could win that day or you could get seventh or eighth. If you qualify really well and you've got the speed in twins cup, you know, there's a good chance that you're, you're going to the podium. Yeah. I think, um, I think half a second in the twins cup means a lot more than half a second in the junior cup based on qualifying just because, um, you know, half a second in the junior cup, it gives you a little bit of confidence, but there's really no telling come, come the race time. And I've seen half a second in the twins cup this year turns into a, a big, big gap. So I'm really looking forward to it. So Gus, I, I'm a professor perfectionist which is a nice way of saying that i have obsessive compulsive disorder and i i try to use it for good not evil with my proofreading because i can see mistakes a lot of times before i even read them but it also drives me nuts with regard to numerology or results or things like that so now that the season's over uh, you you had said yeah you, you're kind of down on all you could in junior cup and you're moving on to twins cup just one point gus <laughs> i mean you look at the season and it's like does it bother you that you you, you, okay. Cody had twice as many wins as you had, but you were more consistent, obviously, because when he didn't win, he had a couple of DNFs. You, you would have won the championship by one point with having half the race wins that Cody had. That's got it. That's got it. You, does it bother you? Um, well, it would bother me even if I lost the championship by a hundred points, but, um, yeah, it, it really does. I just think, you know, back to Pittsburgh, when I just watch Cody sit two seconds ahead of me the whole race and collect two of his race wins, but at least I was in second. So he only got 10 points that weekend. But I mean, you look back and you think, like I said, in the press conference, you can't really look back and wish you did something differently because I kind of think of it this way. I look and I say, all right, well, maybe if I went back in time to change things, it could have gone for the worst. So you never really know. I'm kind of, I mean, I'm really grateful to finish second in the championship. I think um, it's obviously my best, my best yet. And losing by zero points, it's, it's a tie. And um, you know, it doesn't, it obviously doesn't get any closer than that, but it definitely eats me up a, a little bit to finish in a tie and not, I mean, it's not like there's a championship, purse on the line or anything it's just I mean it's a cool guitar and a national championship but yeah it, it definitely uh it does it bothers me a bit thanks for bringing it up again Sean well yeah I mean and and you know I'm I apologize for that Gus but I also am going to apologize about a couple other things as we go on because 
let's say. You know, we're having this podcast and there's been some stuff I've been wanting to ask you. So one of them is about, uh, you know, I didn't want to bring this up during the year with regard to a couple of years ago, but you've kind of infamously broke your femur. Um, you've been pretty healthy since then, even though you've had some crashes. Has that, does that bother you any anymore? And, and I think you've grown taller. So are both your legs the same length and are you still <laughs> growing? And is everything good for the femur at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here at my desk. I'm looking at, I have this like, shadow box with the hardware that I had in my leg because um I when was it January of 22 I got all the hardware removed from my left femur which I broke uh that was 2020 at the ridge and right. I think we were what's that no I'm agreeing with you that's oh. exactly yep it was at the ridge that terrible weekend for you and uh yeah, yeah exactly and uh Lex yeah that crash yeah so I think I was like fourth in the championship that year or fifth and I had crashed in warm-up broke my left femur and that put me out for the season and then it healed I mean I was when you break a femur they put you back up on your feet um, immediately after surgery and you know then we had a seven day drive home or whatever in the RV but I um it was kind of like it was hurting a little bit with the uh, hardware in there. So we ended up getting it taken out. And since then, that was January of this year. Since then, I've had no problems with it. Um, I've obviously taken hard hits, but, you know, no matter what you're, you know, what matter uh, how healthy you are, you can still get hurt. But um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad to have the hardware out of there because I think, you know, I'd say it's better to not have metal in your body. It might make it a little bit stronger, but I would kind of like, if you sleep on your, on your left side, you can kind of feel that plate there. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really glad to get it out and have no problems with it to this day. Yeah. I think if you're born without plates, you should probably try to get back to that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a rod put in Gus? Um, no. So. I can't, I think it was because of like my growth plates still being open or whatever. They right. had decided that uh, putting a rod in there, like my left uh, femur might never grow again or, or something like that. So they did a plate and six screws on the outside of uh, my left femur. Wow. I, I didn't know that. I thought maybe you did have a rod and that's exactly why I asked you because I know when they pull it down and put it back together they try to you know one of the things of course with hip surgery too they they try to make sure both legs are the same length but obviously you were growing so that's interesting to hear that they solved it that way but um it's good that you got that stuff out um you must be pretty happy with the progression of what you did in the junior cup class because to your point you you improved on your results essentially every year that you were in it so um that's got to feel good that you you kind of progress the way you're supposed to in that series it, it, would you agree with that yeah, I'm really, I mean, I could be a little bit more happy have, you know, to have a number one plate sitting here, but um, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't complain 11 podiums. Uh, last year, I only had three and I'm really happy with how, how far I've come in the junior cup and kind of what I've been able to do on the 400 and, um, you know, moving up, I'm, I'm happy to have some experience on the twin already because I was planning on doing the double duty this year. And then I kind of pushed that to the side and just focused on trying to win a junior cup championship. And um, I'm kind of, I'm glad I did that as well. Cause we don't, we don't really know where we'd be now had we stuck it out with both um, bikes, but yeah, progression wise, I'm, I'm really happy. You know, that twins cup thing is interesting. I mean, Danelle Kingham, who is our, a registration person who well, I know you know and a lot of the writers know I'm, I drove her nuts this entire year because you know she would send me the entry list for each round and you were you were a season entry in Twins Cup 
And I think I'm pretty sure she knew that you were not racing in Twins Cup after you decided not to, but it would show up every time on the list. And I would let her know, you know, Gus isn't riding Twins Cup at this round. I know, but I still have to hear from the team or whatever. So I would always get in touch with your dad and, and Danelle still would have to hear from you or your team, but it was just kind of funny. It's like this formality of, you know, because you were entered, they had to put you on that list, but you know, everybody knew, I shouldn't say everybody, but the initial list would come yeah. out and, and I wondered if many fans would, oh, he's back racing twins again when we all, we knew you weren't. So <laughs> was that weird for you? I mean, you obviously knew you weren't, but did you have people asking you, oh, are you back on the twins bike this weekend? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, not as many people asking if I was back on it, but I had a lot of people asking me, you know, if I was racing it um, and, you know, why I stopped. So I'd kind of, I'd feel like a broken record a little bit, like, oh, I'm just focusing on the junior cup. And I, that was kind of like embedded in my brain a little bit, but um, I mean, it was cool having my name on there and my bike was always, you know, it was a, a parts bike for Maz all year. It was cool just being able to think, okay, going into this weekend, I could literally unload my Aprilia from the trailer and I could race two classes um you know if some uh weekend had came around where I wanted to I could just pull it out and ride we were thinking about doing like road america or something because that's one of my favorite tracks but we ended up not as far as next year goes with the move to twins cup is is that do you have your plans pretty firm I mean is it going to be rodeo racing again is it going to be a yamaha is it going to be an aprilia do you do you know yet or are you solidified with what you've already got um, I don't know, actually. Um, there's some ideas going around, but, uh, I really, I can't, I have no, no idea at the moment. You might see me on a Yama dog maybe, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I really, I have no idea. I guess that's cool that you have at least freedom to decide, you know, what kind of motorcycle you do want to ride based on what you see from it with other guys riding them and the experience that you have riding some of them. So actually a pretty good position to be in yeah and i'm not we're not locked in with any um like manufacturer either because under the tent this year we had an aprilia and a kawasaki and you know next year we could have a kawasaki and aprilia and a yamaha i I mean we don't have any um any ties with any companies or anything so it's kind of cool to i mean we have our own team and we have all the freedom we could want with anything bike related which is great So I, I don't really know where Hamilton, New Jersey is. I just know that you're from, from Hamilton, New Jersey. And I also know that Anthony Maziato is from Hamilton, New Jersey. So it must be an interesting town with both of you guys in it. Um, I think it's safe to say that Anthony Maziato is a completely different human than you are. Um, but you guys are both on the team together. You're friends. You've grown up together. Do you, do you, well, let's, are you guys actually friends? And how do you hang around with a guy that's so different than, than uh than you or how does he hang around with a guy that's so different than than he is how does that work um well i mean i when i started racing i didn't know maz at all and he was actually in the same high school as my sister and my brother but i was in the middle school so I didn't even know Maz. I didn't even know what Moto America was, any of that. And um, I started riding dirt bikes and I had maybe heard his name like throughout, you know, mutual friends and whatnot. But I didn't, I didn't know Maz until racing. And so it wasn't like we were friends first. And then I started racing. It was, I had no idea who he was. Um, I actually met him at an NJ Mini GP race and I had always, you know, I'd seen him riding the bigger bikes and I was just on a 50 and you kind of dream of the day that you could be one of those guys that are winning everything. And it's like, then it kind of progresses. And then you see him winning Moto America races and you're like, Oh my God, I want to be the guy that's winning Moto America races. And you kind of think about what's next sometimes and hanging around with Maz is really like hanging around with anybody else. I think when, um, when we're hanging locally, it's not, it's not really, sometimes it's not even motorcycle related. It's more of just a friend. And, um, 
I mean, we used to ride dirt bikes like three times a week, but he, he, uh, he kept getting hurt on dirt bikes. So he took a break from that. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm always trying to get him to come out and, and ride on the cart track and stuff like that. But I think hanging out now, it's, it's a, a lot of motorcycle related and then being teammates kind of brings you closer together even more. And it's like, we are a bit different, but when it all, I mean, we, we both share motorcycles and that's kind of, that's kind of it. Yeah. But so the other thing you share Gus, as I recall is didn't Maz also break his femur at some point? Yeah. So he broke his femur in, uh, May of 20 and I broke mine in September, or August or whatever. And, um, so I had like, it was weird because I had I knew it. he broke his, he was in Oklahoma when he broke his and he came home and I was, you know, helping him out with whatever I could. And so like the femur was a really like hot, like topic, you know, it was like on all of our minds because Maz had just broken his, it was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I was like, geez, I don't, you know, I don't want that to happen to me, but and then next thing I know, I'm laying on the side of the track with a broken femur. And I was like, oh, wow, like that just really became a reality for me as well. And it was like, you know, it wasn't nice that either of us had broken our femurs. But at least when I broke mine, I had a best friend that is going through the same thing. And he was a little bit ahead of me at the time. So I kind of knew everything that I need to ex expect, like physical therapy uh, wise. Um, all the side effects from everything I knew already because of Maz. And so I guess that sort of helped me a little bit. But then um, the way Maz's surgery had gotten done, he his um, healing had kind of taken a halt and I kept healing. So in in the end, I was actually healed long before Maz because he had to get an additional surgery done. Yeah. I remember that. I remember at one point you guys both were on crutches or whatever, however it was, but I, I was like, wait a minute, this happened a long time ago. It seemed like it was over a year that he was still dealing with his situation. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and Gus help us with this one thing, cause this is a misnomer. This is something that people, many people in the paddock don't know or realize pronounce for everyone in the world that's listening on this podcast, the proper pronunciation of Anthony's last name. Anthony Maziato. Right. I just said that like as right. if as if I was like calling his name or something. I don't I know some people say Ma Maziato. I say right. Maziato. I've never really I've never really thought about it, but well we do too. I set you up there, but your dad is adamant about it. Your dad actually schooled me one day. Hey, it's not Maziato, it's Maziato, it's Maz, it's Maz. And I'm like, okay, well, you're the New Jersey guy. Um, you probably, uh, you probably have it right, but okay. So even no, that's you guys actually, pronounce it the way most all of us are. Yeah. So when, if you call him, your dad call him Maz. You? no, but I call right. him Maz, like, Hey Maz. But then when I say his name, it's Anthony Maziato. So I, I guess I'm, thing. I'm all messed up too. <laughs> I, I just combine it. If you say two things, maybe one, if one of them is right, then you don't look stupid, right? You just look like you made a mistake on the other side. Yeah. Like Corey, Corey Ventura calls him Moz and he's the only one he's like, yeah, he's like, Hey, Moz. And then I'm always like, I'm always thinking like, yo, it's, it's Maz. But then I guess if you, if you call him Maziato, I guess that'd be correct. So, so you're a hybrid of it there. Um, okay. Yeah. Hey, now comes the time in our podcast, Gus, I'm setting you up for this. Are you ready for this? Gus Rodeo yep. has an announcement to make about what he's doing. Gus, tell us what you're doing now that the season's over. Oh, um, I guess the, what's coming up, I'm racing BSB. Um, yeah, talk about October. it. Yeah. Yep. So second, week, second weekend in October, um, I'm racing for SimSiris Motorsport. Um, I believe my teammate for the weekend is first or second in the championship at the moment and um junior super sport class so 
it's basically like the junior cup, the Moto America junior cup of BSB. And, um, I've raced against uh, a couple people that race that series and I'm just trying to get over there, meet some new people, learn a few things. They have, they have quite a bit of riders in that class and they look pretty quick. So, um, hopefully I learned something and I just, I really want to see where I stack up over there. This doesn't mean that I want to ride in their class next year because I'm really looking forward to getting on the twin, but, um, you know, I figured what, what better thing to do than get over, uh, overseas and just see where I stack up. Well, I got one more question. I got, I got one more question, then you can finish it up, Sean. We, we all know what a great, I mean, little racer Kayla Yakov is, and she's obviously does a great job of just, I, I mean, I just think of her as one of the guys in the paddock, honestly. And as I mentioned in the press conference the other day, it's like, she's, she's gone from being a girl racer to just a really good motorcycle racer. I don't think she needs the girl part anymore to, to bring her any more acknowledgement than what she gets because she's, she does that with just her, her abilities and her results on track. Is it, is it different for you though, when you race her or is it not? Nope, not at all. Yeah, um, I didn't think so. When I, when I raced against Kayla, I mean, I raced against Jamie a few years ago, Ostadio. And, um, when I raced against Kayla, it's not, it's not anything different than racing against, you know, one of the guys, because it's not like she holds back. She's, I mean, actually she's the most aggressive junior cup rider in the class. So, um, I don't even, th I mean, I don't really, you know, if she passes me, I pass her. When I pass people, I don't really think about who they are, really. I just kind of make the pass and then worry about it later. But, um, yeah, no, it's it's not any different than racing against anybody else. Just, you know, just because she's a female, I, I think she's, you know, fully capable. Obviously, she's winning races and she's really fast. I agree. Uh, Gus, I know I... I I know that she's, as you said, no, no different than anybody else out there, but I do know one rider out on that track that rides different. And I'm going to ask you about that person. He's only showed up at our past two rounds, Ryoto <laughs> Ojiwara. How about that kid? That was kind of interesting at Jersey, right? Yeah. Um, at Jersey, even I was watching back the barber race too. And I didn't know he was so close on the last lap to me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm like, I saw, I saw in the video, him coming into turn five. He's like, he's just, he likes to, he, I mean, he rides differently, like dive bombs. And then he doesn't worry about any of the consequences. Like on these junior cup bikes, it's all about momentum. And when you're getting just blocked past into one of the fastest corners on the track at Jersey, and then you're getting passed by three other guys out of the corner because he absolutely blew your drive. It, uh, it's not the best, the best case scenario. I think there's a lot of people in, in my, in, well, in the junior cup class that know how to race these bikes to their full capability. And that's keeping up the momentum because they're very slow as it is. So you kind of have, you know, something like that happen and, and that really shakes things up a lot, but I mean, he, he wasn't horrible to race against. I think he, it was mainly just a couple laps. He threw it into um, turn one, just way offline, you know, hard on the brakes, blowing the corner. And I was just kind of like, oh, man, that just I thought it had killed my race. Thankfully, it all worked out in the end. But in the moment, you're like just pissed off. <laughs> we, we, we remember in that press conference, it was a little bit interesting for you. But and then he was at barber too so we'll have to see well if i, I imagine if he, he's back he'll probably race in junior cup again but he'll be in twins cup so not your concern but let's go back to talk about bsb a little bit so what is it about you jersey boys and getting these uh these opportunities over in europe obviously one of your buddies brandon posh has had a lot of time over in in, in england did he have any influence or involvement in get in helping you get this ride um coming up um, yeah, Brandon, Brandon has opened up a lot of doors in my career alone, as I know he's, you know, done a few for, for other people as well, but he, um, 
he really did help me out a lot. And uh, I always watched Brandon overseas thinking about, you know, getting over there. I want to try it. I want to try it. And um, it was a, so one of my sponsors, Luxstar VIP, it's a mutual sponsor to Brandon. And he actually um, lined up this whole trip for me. He got, um, he has friends over there because of Brandon racing over there. And um, he lined up the team. He lined up everything for me, which is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Brandon, you know, um, introducing me to Luxstar VIP and, and stuff like that, it definitely helped me to get this whole thing lined up and, you know, just helping me out in general. Yeah, well, we we – yeah, obviously wish you luck um, over in England. Um, we'll have to pay attention to that and see what's going on. I mean, it's amazing. We've got we've got Petrucci racing this weekend over in uh, in Burram, Thailand with um, obviously, you know, well, not in the same class as Cameron Bobier, but Cameron Bobier, Sean Dillon Kelly and Joe Roberts. And then we're going to have obviously Garrett Gerloff next weekend, who's racing in Portimao with Jake Gagne. Gagne. And then we have um, Gus Rodeo, who's going to be over in BSB. So um, Gus, you're going to be an international racer like the other ones. And we wish you a lot of luck with that. Do you expect that the riding over there, you know, we talked about Ojiwara. Do you, have you seen how they ride uh, 400s over in BSB? And do you expect that it's probably going to be kind of the same? Um, well, before I answer this, it's not just me that's going to BSB. Um, there's going to be three of us over there, so you'll have to stay tuned as to who the other two are if they oh. haven't announced it already. Um, yeah, it's going to be really cool. Three different classes, three different American riders going over there. And um, I, I watched their, yeah, I watched their junior super sport um, races and just – it looks like a junior cup race pretty much. I mean, rubbing elbows, um, drafting, that's going to be, uh, you know, after I've been playing brands hatch on ride for the video game for a while now. And I know that back straight away, there's going to be a lot of drafting there, but, um, it just, it just looks like any other 400 race. I mean, they can't really vary that much because you, the 400 is a 400, no matter what, country you're in it's going to be a ninja 400 and you have to race it a certain way so i'm not really i'm not really too nervous about the racing over there um i think it's going to be kind of weird ha you know battling with people where i get off the track and i don't even know who you are i was thinking about that but um you know that's i don't think i don't think it can vary that much to be honest okay well, listen, give them hell over there, and it'll be interesting to hear who these other two riders are. Um, I had seen on your social media that you were d doing this. That's why I thought, well, I guess we can talk about it. We didn't we didn't uh, steal your thunder there, I don't think, but no. I'm glad you announced it on here. So, Okay, but thanks for, thanks for being on with us, Gus, and uh, I want to wrap up by saying that this episode of Off Track with uh, Carruthers and Vice was brought to you by Manscaped, who is our new sponsor. Um, go to manscaped.com and get 20% off um, plus free shipping. You just have to use the promo code off track at manscape.com and uh i haven't used the product yet but i'm supposed to be getting it and i'm i'm going to give you a full report but it won't be anything visual and i don't think paul's going to give you a visual <laughs> the lawnmower report either, but we'll, we'll talk about yeah. yeah yeah the lawnmower and the uh what's the other one called the weed whacker i think so um <laughs> oh yeah but uh anyway so that's that's it for manscape so um so that applies to you gus get on there and uh you know off track, punch that code and get 20% off. They got all kinds of stuff on that website to make you look good. So um, do that on and uh, everybody out there. But thanks again, Gus, for being on. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Gus, and good yeah. luck in Thank England. Thank you guys for having me.